Aloha, good morning, or maybe good afternoon, depends where you are. Morning for me. Uh, my name is Robin. I'm the Education Manager for Pacific Well Foundation. Welcome to my home. Uh, thanks so much for joining me for our second live virtual classroom. Um, I want to get to our materials list right away. I think what was posted may have been last week's materials list, and I hope that you're up for participating with me this morning. So I want to make sure that you can gather all the materials that you may need. So that's the blue writing down there you will need. Um, and there's lots of ores there. Please get creative. Um, so while you're taking a look at the materials list, while you're getting that, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, as some of you may or may not already know, we've been following guidance from Hawaii State and County officials. And Packwell Eco Adventures has suspended Eco Tour and Store operations from March 20th to April 30th. Um, so with our social enterprise temporarily put on hold, Pacific Whale Foundation is completely relying on donor support. Um, so right now it's really important that our team transitions to program engagement um, in a web-based environment through opportunities like this, like the virtual classroom, uh, so that we can sustain our connections. Uh, the role that we play in keeping people connected for the sake of the environment is incredibly important in times like these. If we all take proper precautions and continue to treat each other with kindness and care, we'll get through this together. Um, and we're super fortunate at Pacific Whale Foundation to have an online regularly engaged audience of more than 250,000 individuals. I know they're not all tuning in with us right now, but anyone that is, we're super, super grateful to have you. Um, because now is not the time to be asking for major gifts. We're imagining a moment where each supporter simply donated $5. This would allow our research, education, and conservation programs to thrive through this uncertain time. So if you're able, we hope you'll join in this exciting vision of ours. Um, if you do want to learn more about upcoming online events, we've got lots of fun things in store, um, I highly recommend joining our mailing list. And you can do that at pacificwhale.org slash mailing dash list. Um, if you are able and you'd like to donate, you can do that at pacificwhale.org slash donate. So those are the, the URLs that are over there above the materials list. So hopefully now I've given you a chance to take a look at the materials list, and hopefully you're ready to go. If not, you'll have time. I'll make sure I mention those again, that we have time before we get into our activity. Uh, but for now, let's go ahead and get started. So uh, the big theme for today um, is humpback whales. Again, that's a species that's very near and dear to our hearts here in Hawaii. Um, and maybe to you elsewhere, um, humpback whales are, are pretty, pretty amazing animals. Um, and they are found throughout the world. Um, so they may not just not be a species that we see here in our area. You may see them in your area too, wherever that might be. So I've got my model here again so we can get an idea of what a humpback whale looks like. Again, this is very, very small much smaller than a uh, real humpback whale, but gives an idea of what they look like. And let's see. See everybody saying hi, good morning, welcome. Thanks for joining me. Um, so today, we're gonna focus on something specific related to humpback whales, and that would be uh, part of their anatomy, specifically what's inside of their mouths. Uh, so all of the whales, and just to be clear, dolphins are included in those groups. Um, all of the whales can be divided or classified into two big groups based on what they have inside of their mouths. So humpback whales are part of the group called mysticetes um, or baleen whales. So they have baleen in their mouths. Um, so a lot of you probably have an idea of what this is already, but just in case you don't, not to worry, I have a piece of baleen that I can show you. Uh, so this right here is a piece of baleen from a humpback whale. This is a real piece of baleen. I know whales were harmed in the acquisition of this baleen, um, but we do have special permits to have this so we can teach about it. Um, so baleen, I'll bring it a little bit closer so you can see better, is made up of keratin. So that's the same material that our hair and our fingernails are made out of. And so I think you can kind of see this, this hair-like, these hair-like parts here. And this we can kind of think of like really strong, really thick fingernails. So this is what a baleen whale would have inside of its mouth, and they actually hang from the upper jaw. So they hang from the upper jaw, and baleen whales can have 270 to 400 of these plates inside of their mouths, hanging from the upper jaw. Uh, so I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I actually said that right. They have 270 to 400 pairs of those plates inside of their mouths. Uh, so that's a lot of baleen. Um, I've got a model here that I can give you a slightly closer view. 
How is that oriented in the whale's mouth? Great question. So I'm going to show you. Conveniently, I have a model here uh, that shows you inside the whale's mouth. I've removed the lower jaw if that's freaking you out. There is a part that wouldn't cover that. Uh, so right here, this gray part that you can see, this represents the baleen. Uh, so those plates hang from the upper jaw and they fit nice and close alongside one another. So this is again just one plate and I'm showing you the way they would be all alongside one another this way. This gives you an idea of the width. Um, so this is what a baleen whale has inside of its mouth and the size varies depending on the size of the whale. Um, in general, the mysticetes or the baleen whales are on the larger side. And the other group is the toothed whales or the odontocetes. And they, as you might guess, have teeth in their mouths. Um, so I've also got a tooth here that I can show you. And this tooth here is uh, from a sperm whale. And uh, in general, baleen whales are on the larger side, toothed whales are on the smaller side. A sperm whale is the largest of the toothed whales. Um, so for toothed whales, their teeth are all uniform throughout their mouths. So a little bit different than us, uh, we have many different kinds of teeth um, in our mouths that have different purposes. I'm not gonna give you a close up of my mouth, you all have your own teeth, you can look in the mirror and see what those are like. Um, but for a toothed whale, they're all uniform throughout their mouths. Um, so I have a, a little model of a dolphin skull that I can show you, I'm gonna switch the view here and I'll show you what that looks like. focus. So all those teeth are uniform throughout the mouth and actually kind of alternate and fit together. So that's what we would see in the mouth of a toothed whale. I saw a question there, so let me take a look. Um, so the thicker side is attached to the top of the mouth. You are correct. So the thicker side, this is where it attaches to the mouth. And the, the thinner part here would be all the way down at the bottom. So before we before we get any further, I can put our view back up here to me. So those are two ways that we can group all of the whales, the mysticetes and odontocetes, or toothed whales and baleen whales. Um, and today, what I want to get to, and I know somebody asked this in our last live virtual classroom session, if you were there, is what do humpback whales eat? So we're going to get to that, but before we do that, we want to do a uh, fun activity, and I want to talk to you just a little bit more about humpback whales. So I mentioned that they're seasonal visitors here in Hawaii. They don't spend their whole year here. Um, and there are other areas, humpback whales migrate throughout the world. Uh, so they spend part of their time in usually tropical areas and part of their time in Arctic or subarctic waters. Um, why do they migrate? Why can't they just stay in one place? So I know we've got a little bit of a delay here. So I'm gonna try to be patient and keep my eye on that live chat there. So why do humpback whales migrate? Why can't they spend all of their time in one place? Um, for example, here in Hawaii, I love being able to spend my whole year here. Why wouldn't humpback whales want to spend their whole time here? Um, so feel free to share your answers me with me there. Bring my, my model back up for reference. It's always nice to have something, something to look at and remember what we're doing. I'm not, not seeing any responses yet. I'm not sure how delayed we are. I'm trying to be very patient here. I'll give you a, a little hint because I asked kind of a, a broad question here. Um, if we stick more to why don't humpback whales spend all of their time here in places like Hawaii in uh, the tropical areas, uh, we're missing something really important for them. So does that help a little bit there? What is it that we're missing for a humpback whale? Why wouldn't they be able to spend all of their time here in Hawaii? Ah, that's a great one. Thank you, Noah. Uh, so Noah thinks it's because they're too hot. Um, so that's definitely a great suggestion. Food, yes, thank you. I'm so sorry. I had to be a little bit patient there with the delay. Um, so yes, so I'm, I'm hearing all kinds of right things. So humpback whales uh, do migrate. A lot of that has to do with food and in some cases temperatures as well. Um, so something I didn't directly ask you, but what do humpback whales do when they're in the warmer water? 
Yeah, there, I see all those answers now, all that food. Thank you so much for participating, guys. I'll make sure that I'm patient next time I ask a question. Um, so humpback whales uh, migrate to these tropical areas, to these warmer waters for their breeding seasons. Um, so they find mates and they give birth to their young. Um, and their young are really what we think is uh, an important part of that migration and the warmer water, like Noah said, but may not be something that they want year round. Um, so when they're first born, humpback whales are, um, they don't really have a lot of fat or a blubber layer, so it would be difficult to keep themselves warm in those Arctic areas. So it's much easier for a newborn or a calf to survive in a warmer area. Um, also, humpback whales have a predator that's typically found in colder waters, and that would be the killer whale or the orca, which is a toothed whale. Um, and so a great way to uh, protect their young, their newborns, who are highly susceptible to being preyed upon, is to migrate to an area where they can't be found. Um, but as I see all of you saying, there is no food. So, and they might get a little too warm, like Noah said also, um, because they do have a thick blubber layer, but that thick blubber layer is slowly deteriorating. They're sustaining themselves on that because there is no food in this area. Um, so the reason I brought that up is because today's lesson is all about food. What do humpback whales eat? How do they feed? We talked about the two different kinds of whales. We talked about toothed whales and baleen whales. And so we're going to do a little activity or a little experiment, and we're going to try out those different feeding methods. So we're going to create our own ocean, of course a mini, a simulated ocean, and we're going to put some food in there. We're going to put one kind of food in there, and we're going to try out the two different feeding methods and see which works best. So I'm going to put that materials list back into your view again here one more time so that you can gather anything that you may not have already. Um, so starting with that large bowl or baking pan, really this can be a container, this can be a smaller bowl, whatever you have. Um, again, be creative. And I recommended that you fill that about halfway with water. So if you already have that or you're grabbing that, go ahead and fill it about halfway with water. Can just be tap water, any temperature, doesn't really matter. I've already gone ahead and done that in the interest of not disappearing for a long time or making the noise of filling it. Um, so while you're doing that, the reason I recommended you fill it halfway, you want a good amount of water in it, um, but you don't need so much that it's going to be too heavy to transport or that you're going to end up spilling it. Um, of course, it is just water, so hopefully if it spills, it's not that huge of a deal. Um, so I'm going to start to get mine set up, so hopefully you're getting your ocean set up. You're getting your container or your bowl or your pan. And so I've got my large mixing bowl here. Checking to make sure it's in view there. So I put my large mixing bowl in view there. Um, so that's ready to go. The next thing that we need is something to represent food. So on the materials list, that was where it mentioned parsley flakes or rice krispies or pepper flakes, even shredded paper. Um, our goal here is something small and something that floats. Um, when we do this in the classroom, I usually use Rice Krispies or Parsley Flakes. Um, I don't have those at home, so I'm improvising and I'm using my Red Pepper Flakes. Um, so again, something small and something that will float. And I'm going to go ahead and add that to my ocean. So if you've gathered your food, or go ahead and gather your food and start to add some, we don't need to go crazy with it. We just kind of want to cover the whole surface there. And if some of it sinks, that's okay too. So I'm going to go ahead and put my, my food on here. Okay, that should be plenty for our experiment. Okay. So I'll let that sit there for a minute. I'll make myself just a little, a little bit larger for now. The last two things on the list are our feeding tools. So we're simulating feeding like a toothed whale and feeding like a baleen whale. And so to feed like a toothed whale, that's what the chopsticks are for. And don't worry, first of all, if you don't know how to use chopsticks, we're not using them that way. We're using one in each hand. Uh, so if you don't have chopsticks, maybe you have two forks. You can use the back ends of two forks um, or something else. I trust that you guys are pretty creative. Um, and if you can't find anything else that would be a good substitute, you can use your fingers. But here's the rule. You use one finger from each hand. Maybe even it would be better if you use your pinkies. One pinky from each hand and put them together to catch food. Um, or the chopsticks and put them together to catch food. So one in each hand. Um, the other tool that we would be using 
is the comb. And the comb is going to be for feeding like a baleen whale. And if you don't have a comb that you can use, uh, maybe you have a small strainer or even a fork, the top end of the fork where the tines are, you can use as well. So those are the last of the materials that you need. Those are our tools. So what we're going to do is try feeding like a tooth whale first. And so I'm going to give us about 20 seconds to do that. So I'll use my phone to set a timer. I'll say begin when the time has started. And hopefully you're right there with me and you can use whatever tool you're using, your chopsticks or your fingers, to try to catch food during those 20 seconds. Um, one last thing that might be helpful that I'll mention, I'm going to make myself a little smaller here, is a towel alongside your setup. Um, that can serve a couple purposes. If you drip at all, you can have that to wipe it up. Um, but that might also be helpful to collect whatever you're, you're collecting on uh, so we can compare our two feeding methods. So I have a, a small towel or really a washcloth here that I'm going to use so I can use something reusable. If you have something like that, you can use that's great. If not, maybe a paper towel just to keep handy on the side for collecting. Um, so we're going to do 20 seconds as a toothed whale. You'll probably hear my timer go off when the time is up, but I'll make sure I let you know as well. So I'm going to go ahead and get set up over here. I'm going to lay out my towel so I'm ready to collect. I'm going to get my timer going. All right, we're going to have 20 seconds starting now. So take, again, one in each hand or one finger from each hand and try to catch what you can and collect it on your towel nearby. Okay, time is up. So, put that down. So I'm gonna bring my towel up here and show you so you can see what I caught in 20 seconds with the chopsticks. Okay, so I'm gonna set that back down on the side. When we do the other part of our experiment, I'm gonna make sure I collect on the other half of the towel so that I can compare. So now I'm getting my other tool, I'm getting my comb. And so again, whatever you have to use, a fork is, is a great substitute if you don't have a comb. So get that ready. Pause me if you need to go get that ready. And so I'll make this a little closer. If the what, what, if the what is that was for me, it is a comb. So that's what I'm going to use to feed like a baleen whale. And again, if you don't have a comb, a fork would be a great substitute, something that you can sift through the water with. Uh, so again, I'm going to get 20 seconds on my clock here, okay, and begin. So I'm sifting through the water. I might need a little bit of help here. I might need to use one of my fingers to try to get the food off of the comb and onto the towel. my ocean out of the way. I don't need that anymore. Uh, you can keep that aside if you want to do any other experimentation later on. I'm going to move my results into view. So now you can see what I caught. So up top here is what I caught with the comb and on the bottom here is what I caught with the chopsticks. So now you see my results. I want to hear about your results. So which feeding method was more successful or more efficient for you with the food that we were using, whatever your food was? So please use the, the live chat and share that with me. Um, did you have better luck as a toothed whale with your chopsticks or your fingers or as a baleen whale with the comb or the fork or whatever you were using? So which one was more efficient for you? Which one caught more food? While I'm waiting here, I see a, a question, is that krill? So what I was using in my experiment was not krill. What I was using was just red, red pepper flakes, just to simulate something small that floated in the water. So. See, I'll give it, give it a few more seconds to see if anybody has a some results that they can share with me which feeding method was more successful for you. The second one, the scooper one, 
You got more than me with the comb. All right, well, you did a great job with that then. I'm, I'm still practicing. The baleen whale, awesome. Thank you guys so much for participating. I love seeing this. I just have to make sure I'm, I'm patient here with the delay. Um, so yeah, you guys got the same results that I did, uh, which I hoped for, right? So it was, it was easier for us with this food as a, as a baleen whale. So let's put some of this together. Let's think about what we know so far. Baleen whales are usually the larger ones. Toothed whales are usually the smaller ones. Um, we used some small food here in this experiment. So which type of whale is more likely to eat the small food? Baleen whales or toothed whales? Who's more likely to be eating small food? Wow, I like this. Noah counted his. So he knows exactly how many he got. I didn't go that far and count, but I probably got close to three with the chopsticks too. Um, more success with the fork. Excellent. Thank you guys so much for participating. Um, so I might actually, I'd love to see your responses there on the question I just asked, but I might also answer it myself because and what you guys might come up with when, when you respond, when I see your responses, is that it was sort of a trick question and we kind of already know the answer, right? Our experiment helped clear that up. Um, it's just a little bit tricky because it's different than you might think. Um, baleen whales tend to be much larger, um, but they do tend to eat the small food, much smaller food. Excuse me. And toothed whales tend to be smaller. Yeah, there are all those answers. You guys are right. Um, but the smaller ones actually tend to eat larger food. So when we were feeding like a toothed whale in this simulation with the tiny food, it was really difficult. Um, it's actually much easier uh, to eat the smaller food in the method that a baleen whale uses. So let's talk about that a little bit more. Let's come back to our baleen here. So we talked about what this is, hangs in the mouth from the upper jaw. And remember, there's lots and lots of these. There's between 270 and 400 pairs of baleen plates in a humpback whale's mouth. So they hang nice and close together, but there's little, little spaces in between. So the baleen actually work a lot like the comb did moving through the water. So water was able to get through those little spaces between the teeth and the comb, but the food, whatever food you were using, was not able to get through. So that's exactly what happens when baleen whales feed. So they open their mouth really wide and they take a big gulp of whatever it is that they're trying to eat, but they live underwater. So when they open their mouths, water goes in and it's seawater. They don't want to drink seawater. They don't need to drink seawater. They need to get it out of there. So what they do is they use their tongue to push the water through those little spaces between the baleen plates and the food gets trapped inside and they can swallow it whole. So what's food for a humpback whale? And some of you guys already mentioned this. So you mentioned one of the things that a humpback whale likes to eat, uh, which is krill. And that's, again, something that we don't have here in Hawaii and in the other breeding areas for humpback whales, which is why they don't spend all of their time there. Um, so I've got this little block here. I'm going to put close to the camera so you can see it. These are krill. Sorry, it's a little bit backwards for me to figure out where to put this so you can see it well. Um, so these are some krill preserved in a resin block. So they are real, real krill. Um, this gives you an idea of what size they are. So think about a humpback whale. I didn't mention this today, um, but fully grown can be about 40 to 45 feet long. So as long as a yellow school bus, and this is the size of something that they're eating. So they don't just eat one or two of these or a handful of these. They can eat tons and tons of these. Now, when I say tons and tons, I don't mean literally in weight, but I mean lots and lots, lots and lots of krill. And another thing that they like to eat are small schooling fish. Now, this isn't a real one. I don't have a real model. Uh, this is just kind of a, a generic, generic fish to give you an idea of about the size of the fish that humpback whales might eat. Um, herring, mackerel, and capelin are some of the types of fish that they like to eat. And again, not just one or two, um, but lots at one time. So we think about that. Our comb worked a lot like the baleen. It filtered the small food out of the water. Uh, for toothed whales, remember, we had a really hard time with our chopsticks or whatever we were using trying to catch that really tiny food. So if you think back to 
the model that I showed earlier, I'm going to see if I can show it on this camera. Uh, I'm not sure how great that's going to look. Oh, well, maybe you can see it. Um, so the way those teeth are, imagine trying to catch something small between those teeth, the way they are there in the body. So that's not easy, but catching something larger is easier. So for tooth whales, they only eat one thing at a time. Uh, this, it depends what they eat on the species, but a lot of the species eat different kinds of fish and, uh, or squid. Uh, so they're going to use their teeth not to trap it in their mouth and not to chew the food, but really just to grab the food. Um, so some species of tooth whale also swallow their food whole. Some might use their teeth to tear their food into swallowable pieces, um, but not used for chewing. So that's a little bit about the different feeding methods uh, for the different types of whales. I've got some time if you have any questions. I'm going to be patient this time. I will wait for the questions um, with the delay. I'm going to reorganize some things here and get my information ready again. And so I can keep an eye on some of those questions. If you have about humpback whales or our activity today, One thing I'll mention while I'm, I'm waiting for the questions, um, I forgot to mention when I talk about feeding for baleen whales, I often like to mention the scene from Finding Nemo when Marlin and Dory end up getting, I shouldn't say swallowed by a whale, but end up inside the mouth of a whale. Um, that kind of gives you an idea of what that looks like and how that works. Uh, there's only one thing that's, that's not quite right there, and that would be uh, ex exiting the mouth through the blowholes. So the blowholes for whales are not connected to the mouth. It's not like us where we can breathe through, <coughs> excuse me, both our mouth and our nose. Um, but otherwise, that gave you a good idea from the inside of what that might look like. All right, and I see some, some things coming in. So good question. What are the names of some of the toothed whales? So toothed whales, uh, the sperm whale, I mentioned that one. That's the, the tooth that I have here. Um, a killer whale or an orca is another toothed whale. And dolphins are also considered toothed whales. So some of my favorites that are the species we commonly see here in Hawaii are the bottlenose dolphin, the Hawaiian spinner dolphin, the pantropical spotted dolphin, and the false killer whale. Um, so those are a few of the toothed whales. Uh, thanks for that question, Noah. Um, I'll give it a few more seconds to see if I see some other questions. Um, if for some reason I, I didn't get to a question of yours or you think about one later, uh, please feel free to keep in touch with me. Education at PacificWhale.org is an email address that you can use to reach my education team. Um, we'd love to hear from you if you have questions. If you want to share photos of you participating in our live virtual classroom, if your experiments at home, anything like that, please, please feel free to share those with us. Uh, let's see, good question. So we saw humpbacks breaching in May last year on the north shore of Oahu. Uh, is it normal to see them so late in the year in Hawaii? Uh, yeah, basically with wild animals, they, they kind of do whatever they want. Um, and although we think of a, a season here for humpback whales, um, they, they are really doing their own thing. And, and we're not quite sure exactly what's triggering their timing of their migration. Um, but the whales are trickling in and out. So each whale spends on average about 15 days actually here in the, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm doing a lot of talking today, uh, here in the Hawaiian Islands. Um, so depending on how early or late they arrive, that's how long they might stay. Um, so often we have our first sightings here in October, um, maybe not consistent sightings until December. And then whales could still be around um, through May or even June. Um, yeah, that's, that's not uncommon. Um, if in the middle of the summer we see a whale, usually something's a little bit different or concerning. Um, but certainly uh, in beginning of May is, is still kind of normal season of time. Good question. Um, so let's see. So when they're in Alaska and it's cold, there's lots of krill. And when in Hawaii, it's our winter, so they really like cooler water. Well, okay, good question. Um, so yeah, so in the cold water, um, there are a lot of nutrients and there's a lot of food there for them. So they could spend their whole year um, in the colder water actually being around food. That might be something I would do. I tend to be kind of lazy and I like to be near the food. Um, the migration is mostly because of those calves, we think, that they make that migration. Um, and the males are looking for baits, so they tend to follow the females. 
Um, so our water is a little bit warm for the humpback whales, but since they're feeding off of their blubber layer, they're cooling off, so to speak, a little bit or losing some of that fat, some of that insulation. Okay, so where do whales go when they aren't in Hawaii? Well, there are 14 different population segments of humpback whales throughout the world. Um, so each population has their own migration patterns. Um, so generally speaking, for the humpback whales that we see here in the Hawaiian Islands, they migrate between Hawaii and Southeast Alaska. But there are some, some exceptions there. There is some fluidity. There are other feeding areas in the North Pacific, like Russia or um, the coast of Canada or even the the North Pacific or uh, the Pacific Northwest coast of the United States, where our population of humpback whales might be feeding. All right, I'm seeing some more results. Thank you guys so much for sharing. I'm gonna move my my view a little bit smaller as I start to say goodbye here. I just wanted to put those URLs up here again one more time. We would love to stay connected with you and have you stay connected to all of these cool virtual um, and web-based opportunities that we're offering. Um, so I really recommend joining our mailing list. You can get all that information. We send that out weekly of what's to come. Um, so you can go to pacificwhale.org slash mailing dash list and sign up there. And again, if you're able and you'd like to support our research, education, and conservation programs, please visit pacificwhale.org slash donate. Um, and again, if you have any other questions, if you want to share any photos of you in our activity today, of your own experiments, anything like that, please send an email to our education team, education at pacificwhale.org. Look forward to seeing you again virtually soon. Aloha.